Welcome everyone to another lecture on the Plain Gains channel. Today I'm going to be teaching you everything you need to know about cholesterol. I will also say before we start that this is not medical advice, so if you're going to make any changes to your diet or your lifestyle, that you should consult a doctor first. Also, if you're enjoying the content, please be sure to like and subscribe as that helps our channel grow. Okay, so in order to understand cholesterol, we must first evaluate both its structure and its function and properties. So if you take a look on the right here, you can see what the molecule of cholesterol looks like. For those of you who don't have a background in organic chemistry, this might look quite daunting, but to keep it simple, all of the vertexes and the lines represent the carbon molecules and there are some H's surrounding them and the OH represents a hydroxyl or an oxygen and a hydrogen. So the cholesterol molecule is amphipathic, which basically means that it has a both a polar and a nonpolar region, which I've circled here. For something to be polar, it basically means there's a disproportionate distribution of electrons in one area as compared to another, which is causing there to be a difference in charges. So as you can see here, the oxygen and the hydrogen is labeled as polar. That's because oxygen has more electrons surrounding it, which is causing there to be a dipole in that direction. Cholesterol is primarily hydrophobic. That's because a majority of the molecule is nonpolar. This means basically hydrophobic, so it's afraid of water. It won't dissolve easily in water. And that's important because our blood is basically just water, so it cannot travel freely in blood. Moving on to its function, cholesterol functions in pretty much every single cell in your entire body to regulate cell membrane fluidity. In temperatures that are very high, cholesterol inserts itself into the phospholipids to help increase the melting temperature so the membrane doesn't melt. In low temperatures, it inserts itself into phospholipid clusters in order to prevent them from coming too close together and becoming too rigid, as cell membrane fluidity is important to maintain for biological life. Additionally, cholesterol is utilized in the synthesis of vitamin D3 and bile acids. Both of those are important for overall health, bile acids specifically for digestion, and it's also the backbone for certain hormones, which you can see here on the right with my mouse. You can see a lot of different hormones that you've probably heard of before, notably here testosterone and estrogen. So cholesterol is both ingested dietary and synthesized by every single cell in our body. Out of the synthesized cholesterol, approximately 20% comes from the liver and the intestines, and it is auto-regulated based on the amount of cholesterol that you consume. So that means when you're consuming higher levels of dietary cholesterol, your body's going to make less because you don't need it. Like I mentioned before, because cholesterol is hydrophobic, it is transported in the blood via proteins. Particularly, these proteins are known as lipoproteins, and there is a variety of different types of lipoproteins, which you can see in this graph on the right. The lipoproteins range in a variety of sizes, and they have different contents, going from very low-density lipoproteins, intermediate-density lipoproteins, low-density, and high-density lipoproteins. The ones on the right here, low-density and high-density lipoproteins, are the ones you usually hear on your blood work panels when they're talking about good and bad cholesterol. For those of you who have never heard that before, your quote, good cholesterol is your HDL and your bad cholesterol is your LDL or non-HDL cholesterol. This is going to be a little bit more important when we get to talk about risks with dietary cholesterol and saturated fat intake. Okay, so a little bit more on LDL and a particular type of lipoprotein called apolipoprotein B, or in short, ApoB protein. So if you take a look on the right here, you can see that there is an ApoB protein on the exterior of all of these different lipoproteins. So that's basically what it is. It's a protein that sticks out on the exterior of the different lipoproteins. This protein can kind of get kind of cause the particles to get trapped in your arterial wall, which can allow the cholesterol to or other fats to get deposited into the arterial wall, which is basically the start of atherosclerosis. So as you may be able to imagine, cardiovascular disease is related to the ApoB particle number and also the LDL particles. That's basically because when you have higher levels of them, there's a higher chance that one of them gets lodged in your arteries and begins to develop atherosclerosis. If you take a look at the chart a little bit higher, you can see that people with the highest ApoB and highest LDL cholesterol have the concordant highest risk of cardiovascular disease. I do want to mention that dietary cholesterol intake is not associated with 
the amount of LDL or ApoB proteins found in your blood, which we'll talk about a little bit on the next slide. So to dispel some misconceptions and to give some key takeaways, again, high dietary cholesterol is not correlated with high LDL. This might be because when you eat high levels of cholesterol, our body auto-regulates it and prevents our body from exceeding ridiculous levels of cholesterol. However, diets containing high levels of saturated fat can increase both the ApoB and LDL levels. This is probably not great, as remember, we know that high levels of ApoB and LDL levels increases your risk of cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. ApoB particle number is probably a better predictor of cardiovascular disease risk, but both ApoB particle number and non-HDL cholesterol are good predictors of cardiovascular risk. And when I say HDL cholesterol, that's just what it's called in the medical world. HDL and LDL are not actually cholesterol. They are lipoproteins that carry cholesterol. Lastly, if you're looking for a dietary intervention, we have a few studies that show replacing saturated fats with unsaturated or um, so that could be poly or monounsaturated fats can decrease your LDL level, which may also result in a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Finally, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please like and subscribe and comment below any questions as I'd be happy to respond to all of them. Thanks again for listening. See you in the next video.